Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. I, this is really a pleasure to be here. Um, I should be coming, my folks and I should be coming down here actually more frequently, and it's not really that far away, and I apologize, we'll def double our efforts to do so. Um, we've been pretty busy at, at JAX. Uh, as, as some of you may have heard, this is uh, a brand new institute that is, has been established in Farmington, Connecticut, um, and with the support of both uh, the state of Connecticut as well as Jackson Laboratory. Um, and so I, I hope you'll allow me to indulge me to uh, I wanted to give my presentation, but I have a few slides initially just to tell you a little bit about what's going on at JAX Genomic Medicine and then move into my own area of research in structural genomic variation, which uh, I uh, biasly believe that this is actually a, an area that we still need a lot of work on, but it's critically important if we are to continue to advance any of our efforts in personalized medicine. So, <clears throat> Um, so as a disclosure, um, I'm on the scientific advisory board of these two companies. Uh, we'll mention a little bit about bio-nanogenomics later, but, um, but uh, really I don't think uh, 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 doing much more endorsement beyond that. So um, the Jackson Laboratory was established in 1920. Uh, as you know, its uh, main headquarters is in uh, Bar Harbor, Maine, a beautiful place to visit during the summertime. Um, and it was established by Dr. Clarence Cook Little, shown here, who was a Harvard professor, uh, went on to become president of the University of Michigan, and then for some reason decided he wanted to set up shop somewhere in the far northeast corner of the country uh, to, uh, to use, study mice and use it to study human diseases. Uh, so this is a picture of Clarence Cook Little. And, um, and currently, the Jackson Laboratory, uh, many may not know, we now have three locations. So uh, first of all, the, of course, the Bar Harbor main campus. Uh, we have a facility in Sacramento, California, which is primarily used for uh, in vivo pharmacology testing uh, and also some mouse production for the Asian countries. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the Farmington, Connecticut campus. Uh, this is a picture of the Bar Harbor campus. We have about 35 faculty there uh, studying various aspects of human diseases. Um, <clears throat> we, if you ever go up to Bar Harbor uh, and visit the Jackson Laboratory there, uh, and for some reason decided you want to actually count every mouse that's being bred, uh, you'll find that there's actually more than a million mice at any time in the year being bred for medical research there. We ship out about four and a half million mice uh, every year uh, to researchers, about 22,000 researchers around the world, and we bank more than 8,000 different varieties of strains, um, et cetera. Uh, so it, it is really a powerhouse in terms of uh, mouse resources for studying human diseases. I mentioned the Sacramento, California facility for in vivo uh, cancer stem cell uh, services and pharma, uh, pharmacological studies. Uh, and then this is our campus in Farmington, Connecticut. Uh, I, I genuinely want to put out a plug that if you are coming by or you're in the area, uh, you'd like to come and visit, please do drop me a note personally uh, and love to arrange for a tour and for you to meet some of our faculty. I really want to see uh, more and more collaborations between our faculty and, and, and those here with uh, other researchers, especially in the state, uh, to advance uh, all of our research programs. Um, uh, you know, when I came in 2013 to Jack's Genomic Medicine, uh, didn't have a lot of guidance. Was basically told, you know, do something big and and successful in in genomic medicine. Now, obviously, we could do a lot of. There's a lot of different areas in genomic medicine we could have done research in. Uh, I settled in on sort of this uh, the, these four well four to five areas that we wanted to do some uh, concentrate uh, our our research focus in. And so, of course, one of the areas is of cancer. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. There's uh, a lot of uh, impact of personalized medicine in cancer these days. Um, I, an emergent area, of course, is the microbiome. Uh, and there's a lot of intersections with microbiome studies also and, and cancer. So that's very good. Uh, immunology was an area which really over the past uh, five, six years has taken off in terms of the combination of genomics immunology and human genetics as well. So that was an area we decided we also wanted to concentrate on. And uh, of course, it wouldn't make sense unless you had a human genetics component, those that are both uh, non-clinicians and clinicians that are specializing in human genetic research. Uh, and, and, and sort of intersecting these four domains, uh, we clearly needed uh, uh, 
major uh, investment in computational sciences, both in the faculty as well as uh, hardware and, and so forth to make that possible. So this is sort of like what, this is sort of what we're building at Jax Genomic Medicine. Uh, at the moment we've, we've uh, have, uh, oh, at the moment we have, uh, uh, I think, filled in most of these areas, um, cancer, immunology, we're still recruiting for microbiome and, and human genetics and always on the lookout for great computational scientists. Um, to give you a feeling for the, the pace at which we've been hiring faculty at, uh, we currently have about 25 PIs, uh, and that's been accomplished over three and a half years. So that's on average we've been hiring about eight PIs per year uh, to JAX Genomic Medicine. I have gained tremendous weight in the last three years. You can imagine how many lunches and dinners that, that amounts to. <clears throat> I know every restaurant in, in the West Hartford area, I swear. Um, our faculty, uh, I'm not going to go through them uh, uh, one by one, but just show you that it's a very attractive faculty. They're, they're, they're very good looking, uh, in addition to being smart. Um, and, um, and the most recent recruit that we've just uh, brought on board is a gentleman named Mark Adams. Uh, about, a, uh, about a month ago, there was an announcement on it. Uh, Mark Adams was the scientific director of the Craig Venture Institute in La Jolla. Uh, and has actually come, we are very happy to, to snatch him from, uh, from Craig. He's come to, uh, to build up a large microbiome initiative uh, in JAX and hopefully in, in, uh, involving uh, UConn and, and Yale here in the state. Uh, and we've also in the institute got, uh, spent, uh, invested a lot in the various technologies, uh, in particular, uh, Genome technologies, as you can imagine, the various genome technologies, including sequencing, uh, led by Chai Lin Wei from the Joint Genome Institute. Uh, Paul Robson is directing our single cell genomics f facility. And we've just brought on board Bill Scarns, who is going to be building up a cellular engineering facility at JAX, uh, IPS C cell uh, work, genome editing, coming to us, where he actually led previously the the, the human IPS work uh, at the Sanger Center in, in the UK. And finally, we have, uh, it was really important to us, uh, partially because of my own background of experiences, but also because we're not a hospital, uh, we, it was really important for us to have a, um, a clinical diagnostic lab there. So that's been led by Honey Reddy and Shen Cheng Zhang, uh, molecular and cyto, heavily on molecular for obvious reasons. And, and just for your information, you know, we have uh, launched for several years now a JAX CTP cancer panel, about 358 gene panel. Many places have that. We also have that as well. Uh, we use that to get CLIA certified, but also to, um, to apply that uh, uh, a little bit more broadly, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, what we don't want this clinical diagnostic lab to be is a lab that would be doing re routine testing. We have the ability to really take new assays. The focus is to take new assays th through the work that's being done at JAX and through collaborations and to quickly implement that in a clear diagnostic setting and then uh, take, send that out uh, to, to uh, others as well. So. Uh, just a little bit of a clear lab. This is a JAX CTP panel. Again, I'm not going to go into it too much. You can pull up the specific information on the JAX website. But suffice to say that having that JAX CTP panel has allowed us to get um, recently uh, an $8.4 million grant uh, that is allowing us to essentially provide the JAX CTP panel to uh, all cancer, future cancer patients in the state of Maine. Uh, for the next three years. So there will be no charge to any of those patients uh, for the provision of this panel, uh, but it allows us also to uh, interact very closely with the medical oncologist and see how we, this can be used uh, in, in, a, in a medical setting, and we can't bite off too much than, than we can choose, so Maine would seem to be a very appropriate state to, to start uh, applying this cancer panel to. So, uh, for those of you that are interested in learning more about that, happy to discuss that uh, offline uh, with you. And finally, um, I, I think one of the things that JAX uh, is the fact that we have this incredible mouse resource. Uh, we, one of the large scale projects that we are engaged in is the development of uh, cancer PDX or patient derived xenografts, where essentially you're taking human tumors, putting them in immunodeficient mice allowing those tumors to grow, and giving you a biobank, 
in a three-dimensional structure of tum tumors from various tumor types that can be then used for uh, looking at uh, tumor evolution. Uh, it could be used for drug testing uh, capabilities, et cetera. And so um, since we, we have the NSG mice that we've developed and, and that seems to be doing quite well for the, the initiation of these patient-derived xenografts, uh, we, we're basically following this kind of a protocol where you get pieces of patient tumor, putting them into the mice, uh, then the tissue can be harvested, you can do genomic analysis on that, you can bank it, uh, you can expand it in other PDX mice, uh, and then in this case you could then proceed uh, after expansion uh, to drug efficacy testing and, and so forth. <coughs> Uh, what our strategy behind the PDX program is, of course, not we're less interested. I don't know if less interested, but we're we we uh, uh, it's not uh, we're not trying to provide a, uh, a mechanisms whereby we can inform patients in real time about what's the appropriate drug uh, or drug combinations for them to use, but but rather than do that, collect the information into a database where you have these tumors, you have sequencing, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing information generating an integrated genomic signature, uh, having patient outcome uh, information of, uh, appropriated with that, developing this database of the integrated genomic signatures with uh, drug outcomes such that when you have enough of this information available, uh, the next patient that comes along, if you get the genomic signature of that person's tumor, uh, that might help to inform to some degree of accuracy what may be the appropriate drugs or drug combinations that would, uh, that would uh, be applicable to that person's tumor. And so this is sort of the, the strategy uh, that we think uh, might be uh, one way to use the PDX program. And we have over 400 PDXs currently available. Uh, these are available, uh, are made available to all of the, the scientific community. You can, go, again, go onto the JAX website and order uh, which PDX you want. It'll have the clinical information, the, the genomic information available. Uh, but in addition, uh, what we found is as we were doing more and more of this program, we've had uh, numerous investigators come to us basically saying, could JAX serve as a repository for our own PDXs uh, because we're, we're really tired of sending them out to different investigators. We don't have the time or the energy or the desire to do so. Uh, and so we're actually in the process of uh, acquiring more than 1,000 additional PDXs from various uh, researchers uh, that we would add to this repository uh, and make available uh, from, uh, from there on forward. And finally, uh, in terms of the PDX uh, program, I think one of the exciting areas uh, which we're using this is in the area of cancer immunology. Uh, and so just schematically and very simplistically for, for uh, my sake and, and for those others that are, are not as familiar with the field, uh, you can, what we can do is we can take these NSG mice uh, and, and make sure that we've completely eradicated, eradicated any parts of their immune system. Uh, and we have a method now where we can actually inject uh, purified human CD34 positive uh, stem cells uh, into these NSG mice, essentially giving them a human immune system, which you need in order to test uh, cancer immunotherapy uh, treatments. So this is what we now refer to as the humanized NSG mouse. Uh, now we take our favorite PDX tumor, uh, which, ha as I mentioned to you, has g been genomically characterized. Put it into that humanized NSG mouse, treat it with your favorite antibody, which is spelt wrong, sorry, on the slide, and, uh, and then basically determine whether or not uh, th that treatment has been effective. Uh, and uh, if, again, one of the things, and I don't know if this is very naive, but one of the ideas here is as we do, do this kind of testing, are there certain genomic signatures that could help us uh, inform us uh, whether or not a certain treatment, uh, a immunotreatment, will be effective or not? And this could be one way to do that sort of an in vivo or ex vivo type of testing. So, so that's Jackson Laboratory and the PDX program. I'm happy to talk more about it offline with you. But um, to get into a little bit now into my area of interest, which is human structural variation, uh, I start off with this uh, cover that was in 2007, published in Nature, uh, that says that, yes, humans are very similar, but of course, when we look very carefully, we're all very different. We're different heights, different eye colors, different susceptibility to diseases, uh, drug metabolisms, et cetera. And, and of course, uh, for a long time, up till the mid-2005s, uh, uh, et cetera, 
uh, the, the notion was that we were very, very genetically similar. And in fact, the only difference between one another was 0.1% uh, of our total genome. It's, it's quite amazing that we held that thought for so long. Uh, but of course, uh, we now realize that that 0.1% of our genomes that we thought w we're mainly different from are in the, are in the uh, uh, type of single nucleotide polymorphisms. But we now know that, in fact, there's a lot of other types of genetic variation out there in all of our genomes. Uh, and and the, that would be in the form of what we call now structural genomic variants, or SVs. Uh, so of course, I don't need to, uh, this is basically the single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are like spelling mistakes in the book of life. Uh, but we now know that, in fact, uh, it's very common to find these structural variants where we have uh, deletions, insertions, uh, duplications, uh, mobile element insertions, uh, that level of variation. And, and inversions uh, in our genomes, in all of our genomes. Um, and so, of course, the earliest st uh, structural variants or copy number variants were very large, uh, and they were predominantly identified or associated with, uh, with human genomic disorders, highly penetrant. Uh, so this is probably one of the first examples by Jim Lubsky, where he found uh, DNA duplication uh, on chromosome 17 associated with Charcot-Marie Tooth syndrome. Um, and uh, also the corresponding deletion with HNPP. Um, and so that was great, but I think what wasn't understood was that, in fact, these types of uh, d uh, DNA rearrangements in our genomes are a lot more common. They're not just in patients with genomic disorders, uh, and they're found in each one of us, and, and in fact, uh, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, we had uh, made this initial observation at the Brigham um, uh, when Actually, uh, Jeff Sklar, who's joined, uh, kindly uh, lent me some lab space. I wasn't actually given some proper lab space. He gave me part of his lab space, so I, actually, I credit this to you, Jeff. Uh, where we did these array CGH experiments, um, and we uh, basically tested uh, genomic DNA from test sample and genomic DNA from a reference sample, a normal individual, and, and looked for changes in the fluorescent intensity that would tell us whether there were gains or losses of those specific sequences in the human genome that was being tested. And so this technology, of course, was developed initially by Dan Pinkel, uh, and he had, um, he had presented his work at the ASHG meeting in 2002 and showed very nicely how his technology could, was, uh, uh, was uh, very clean uh, and showing, in this case, just a trisomy 19. And, and then if you looked at cancer specimens, you could, in one test, look at all these gains and losses throughout the genome and, and accurately identify where they are and approximately how much gains and losses there were. Um, so I made, of course, the mistake when I was, I was a junior faculty at that time, made the mistake of getting up and asking the famous Dan Pinkel the question uh, because I was very intrigued not about this cleanness but about the fact that there were these little blips uh, in the data that he showed. So I got up and I said, uh, Dr. Pinkel, with, with all humility, I said, Dr. Pinkel, I mean, could you explain to me what those little dots are on, on the edges? He was very upset uh, that I, he felt like I was criticizing his technology. And he said, those are artifacts, ignore them. Of course, like many of us, when you t you're told not to do something, you want to investigate it even more. And so coming back to Boston, I had to find out more about what those little blips were. Um, and so when we, uh, 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 a very talented postdoc that joined my lab, John I. Frady, uh, joined my lab. We, we did a lot of experiments looking at um, what John told me, which was very good as a, as a scientist. I knew he was going to be successful. Uh, he said, look, we've got to do control experiments. Well, what are the control experiments? Well, we've got to take the genomes of healthy, normal individuals and start comparing them to one another in Ray CGH, and you should get a flat line. Makes sense. I would have figured a lot other people had done this in the past, but I hadn't seen that data. So he went ahead and did this experiment. So we expected results like this every time we did the array CGH, uh, but these are the kind of results that he kept getting for every chromosome, these sort of blips on every chromosome uh, when you compared one healthy individual, one genome from a healthy individual to another. So uh, this began to get very suspicious, and we started cataloging where these were occurring. Uh, in the genomes, we did a, a 55 different uh, comparisons. Finally, published the paper. We sent our paper to Nature Genetics, 
Uh, and um, I, to this day, um, this is the hardest publication for us to publish. It took almost 10 months uh, from start to finish, three rounds of, of reviews. Uh, there was, of course, review number three is always the worst, right? Review number three was, I don't believe this BS, and there should be more validation, and the Human Genome Project should have picked this up, and this is nonsense, should not be published in Nature Genetics, I can't believe I'm reviewing this for you guys, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I threatened the, the, the editor of Nature Genetics uh, that I would pull the paper and send it to PNAS. He agreed to publish it. And of course, within a week of our publication, another paper came out in Science. It's basically saying the same thing, that they also looked at it by array CGH, 39 individual genomes, and found the same thing. There was a lot of this copy number variation in the genomes of healthy, normal individuals. So a couple things to remember for the juniors uh, in the room. One, Always, always aim high. I kicked myself for not having sent this to Nature instead of Nature Genetics, uh, since this was published in Science. And second, no matter what you're doing in Science, it seems like there's somebody out there doing the exact same research. So it really is a race to, to the finish, of course, to the most accurate information possible. Um, I also just put this slide in because, for, especially for the junior faculty and the students, uh, this prepare you for what you're in, in coming up to. You have to write grants to support your future research. Uh, I thought having published this paper in Nature Genetics, uh, which is not a shabby journal, uh, that I would have no problem getting grant funding for future work. I was deeply mistaken. I'd actually written six or more proposals, uh, which all went unfunded. I want to share with you actually for a minute some of the criticisms that I got for these grant proposals. So the criticisms I got, four times I got this kind of criticism. The experiments proposed here are no longer innovative simply more of the same thing with higher sample numbers. There's later, little data presented beyond that published in IFRA and 2004. The application is not, I love this, right? The application is not hypothesis driven, does not promise to generate new critical information. Uh, the role of Dr. Lee, I had to put food on the table and you know, stuff like that, so I have to put in part of my re, uh, effort into this. So I put in 40%, they said the role of Dr. Lee at 40% and two Brigham personnel <coughs> seems very excessive. So I toned that down a bit and, of course, got this. The commitment level of Dr. Lee is not sufficient. Um, and uh, finally, there's an ambitious level of data sharing and cooperation promise, and I doubt it can be realistically achieved. End of the story is that, in fact, um, I had to make some major pleas to the NHGRI that, you know, this is really important, uh, that the, we, we need to find some way to fund it. They, they were very... Uh, gracious in finding ways to fund the, grant, uh, this, the project, and we did eventually move forward. So tenacity is very important in, in moving your research forward. So in, in 2010, we published uh, uh, this subsequent paper because we really wanted to understand a bit more about how much of these copy number variants are there in human genomes. Uh, and using this uh, very uh, highly uh, high-resolution back array, we actually found more than 1,000 copy number variants that were 500 base pairs in size or larger uh, uh, in every individual. Of course, if you were from uh, uh, African population, you tended to have more. There's more genetic diversity among Africans. Uh, Europeans' uh, origin was less. Uh, but on average, uh, we were at that stage in 2010, we were identifying about 24 megabases of DNA that differ from one individual to another individual, which accounted for about 0.78% of your total genome as opposed or, or in contrast to the 0.1% difference in our genomes that's accounted for by single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. So a little bit about these copy number variants. Um, they can be simple um, or what we call biallelic, behaving like SNPs where you only have two different alleles, uh, in this case one copy or two copies for a chromosome. That gives you three genotypes for a diploid cell. Uh, and, and there are a lot of those that are out there like that. But unlike SNPs, there are other types of, of CNBs. For example, multi-allelic ones where you can have zero, one, two, or three copies for a given allele, and it, that would result in more than three types of genotypes in, in a given diploid cell. Why is this important? <clears throat> the reason why it's important is because copy number variants, like a lot of structural variants, are very difficult to genotype. When people find things are difficult, they often, type, they often avoid it. Um, and let me give you an example of that. So here is an example of a copy number variant, which is um, the RHD gene. 
So the RHD gene determines whether you're RH positive or RH negative uh, in your blood type. It's copy number variable. In the genome, it's structured like this. Here's the RHD gene. Uh, and there's a similar RHC gene, uh, which I don't think is functional, uh, a little bit further along, uh, uh, f away from it. Here is uh, uh, a father, mother, and son that we um, wanted to test for copy number of the RHD gene. So we, by quantitative PCR, we found out that the, son, uh, the father has two copies of RHD, the mother has two copies of RHD, and the son has one copy of RHD. So um, what would you do if your technician came in and gave you these kind of results? Well, I'm sure you'd do the same thing that I did, sent the technician back and said you made a mistake, go repeat the experiment. After a couple times of coming back with the same results, you realize, huh, there might be something behind it. Uh, and indeed, when you look at it a little bit more carefully, uh, in this case by Fiberfish, you actually find that the, the mother has RHD, one copy on one chromosome, makes sense. The father indeed has two copies of RHD, but when you look at it by Fiberfish, you see that they're actually both on the same chromosome, and then there's zero copies on the other chromosome. And so what's happened presumably in the son, the son has inherited this chromosome from the father, one of these chromosomes from the mother, hence you can have a two copy and two copy in the parents, leading to one copy in the child. And this sort of illustrates the complexity of the genotyping of a lot of these copy number variants, and the need for many investigators to say, to hell with all this, I'm just dealing with SNPs in my study. Okay. <laughs> the impact of copy number variants or other structural variants uh, can be uh, quite, uh, are quite diverse. Here's just simple examples of three genes, gene A, B, and C. Of course, if you have a deletion of one gene, you could have uh, and often do have some decrease in transcription level or duplication, uh, some increase in the transcription level, but uh, actually, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but uh, a lot of people that have actually studied duplications of the gene and the corresponding transcriptional level do not f uh, usually do not find a one-to-one -one correlation. There's a lot of compensatory mechanisms that are undefined uh, that exist uh, and can be shown when you do these kind of experiments. And of course, in some cases, if you have a deletion that in, uh, bisects different genes, you can actually have a fusion gene generated as well. Uh, and then this just sort of illustrates if you have uh, deletions that, in, that take up parts of uh, some exons or, or, or other genes, uh, it can impact uh, gene regulation as well. I'm not going to go into this as well. Uh, so, of course, what are, are the, functional, uh, the functional impacts of these copy number variants? They have been associated with many neuropsychiatric disorders already. Uh, and also associated with some immunological disorders uh, like the FCGR3 gene, uh, predisposing to polymerular nephritis in rats and humans. Um, and this is an example of uh, the beta defensins, which are copy number variable uh, and uh, encode for these secreted antimicrobial peptides. Uh, in Europeans, it ranges of 2 to 12 copies in, uh, with a median copy of 4. Uh, if you have less than four copies of beta defensins uh, in, in, uh, in individuals, there tends to be this general breakdown of the antibacterial wall, uh, in, in that barrier in the intestinal wall, and it's actually uh, significantly associated with Crohn's disease. So the idea is less than four copies of beta defensins and increased association with Crohn's disease. So you can then argue that well, so then we want to have more than four copies of beta defensins. That would be a good thing. But of course, nature has a way of reminding us that the equilibrium and balance is important, not too less or too much of, of, of something. And, and so individuals that have too much copies of beta defensins may not be associated with Crohn's disease, but actually are associated with uh, psoriasis. Uh, and, and that has to do with uh, uh, a, a change in the stat signaling pathway that leads to inflammation associated with uh, psoriasis. So again, copy number variation, too much or too little of anything uh, tend, may not be a good thing for, for human health. Uh, we also know that these copy number variants, uh, some, many of them are evolving under positive selection. What do I mean by that? They're basically uh, mechanisms that our genome help us to adapt and interact with our ever-changing environment. Uh, and, and that sort of makes sense because they're highly mutatable um, and, um, and that's important that if you are, if the environment is changing quite a bit, uh, you want to be able to change parts of our genomes that can rapidly uh, mutate as well and, and then 
uh, have you would have certain uh, selection imposed on that to maintain that in certain environments as well. I'm just going to take a few moments to tell us tell you about my amylase one gene work, which uh, is under positive selection. <coughs> George Perry, uh, who was a PhD student in my lab in Boston, looked at amylase, which is copy number variable and is involved in starch digestion. Uh, and he basically asked the question, if amylase is associated with starch digestion, do we actually see evidence for, uh, for higher copy number of the amylase gene in populations that tend to eat more starch? And those populations that don't eat too much starch, is there evidence that in fact the copy number of amylase is undergoing uh, genetic drift, uh, no, no positive selection against that? And so, uh, of course, starch is found in all these different types of foods that we commonly eat. Um, and what he did was he collected DNA samples from different populations around the world, uh, not necessarily from these specific individuals, uh, but, um, but basically from Asians, uh, uh, Africans, and, and Europeans. So these are some of the African populations and the food population in, in Siberia that are low starch eating populations where we got DNA samples from. And of course, we had the high samples uh, shown earlier. When he plotted this out, basically in gray are those individuals that are from high starch populations, and what is the amylase copy number in those individuals versus those from the low starch populations, and what are their copy number. And you can actually see this shift of, of copy number in the low starch populations more to the left compared to those from the high starch populations to the right, and, and it is significant. Uh, so there does seem to be evidence that if you are traditionally eating more starch, your genomes over time will evolve to increase the copy number of this amylase gene to accommodate uh, the increased starch intake that you're taking. Uh, of course, being a cytogeneticist by training, we, we wanted to visualize this. Uh, and you can actually see here, this is an individual with 14 copies of amylase in their genome, uh, organized as 10 copies on one chromosome four copies on the second chromosome. Here's an individual with six copies of amylase, three copies on one chromosome, three copies on the other. For those that are very, very observant, they'll actually notice that, in fact, not only is there structural variation in terms of copy number of this locus from one individual to another, but even in a single individual, you can see that the orientation of these genes are differing as well. We, do, we still don't know why, uh, what effect that has uh, and why that's occurring. Uh, but uh, it's really interesting to see these layers of structural variation occurring at this one single locus. So um, we then decided, okay, forget about humans for a bit. Let's look at uh, non-humans. So in fact, let's look at another primate species like chimpanzees, which I'm told don't eat a lot of starch. Uh, so we took 15, the DNA from 15 unrelated chimpanzees. How many copy numbers of amylase is there? Every one of them had two copies of amylase in their genomes. Uh, one copy on one chromosome, one copy on, on the other. So that's great. That makes sense. And more recently, Kristen Lindball Toll uh, from the Broad Institute was doing a study on dogs and wolves. Again, the idea here is that do uh, wolves, being in the wild, don't eat a lot of starch. Uh, they should not have need more copies of amylase. But dogs, our poor dogs that we're domesticating in our, in our houses, we throw them the pasta that we're not finishing, their, the bread, etc. And so they're being exposed to a lot more starch than, than the wolves are. And sure enough, when they looked at 35 wolves, uh, unrelated wolves, compared to 35 uh, or more uh, unrelated dogs, there was only two copies of amylase in the wolves, but a, lo a, a diverse increased copy number of amylase in the dogs because of what you're uh, poor dogs are being subjected to. <laughs> so, so this is just one example of a locus in our genome that is adapting, uh, helping us to adapt to the, the environment that we live in under positive selection. Uh, a couple of slides here to tell you about the fact that copy number variation or structural variation is not limited, obviously, to, to, to humans and, and to primates and to dogs. Uh, all, all of the animals, including mice, and, and I think this needs to be remembered and in your own personal experiments because they can have an impact on the out phenotypic outcome. Uh, this is just one example that was published in 2008 uh, and then also some data from 2011, looking at 39 different breeders of mice uh, strains, finding that in fact those different breeders of mice strains which were thought to be uh, identical essentially 
in fact found that 64% of these mice were heterozygous in the copy number of this one gene insulin degrading enzyme. So what impact that has on your experiments is something that you need to be considering. Um, and uh, those that are interested in zebrafish, uh, Kim Brown from my lab, who's now in, in Washington State, uh, did an extensive study of copy number in, in, in zebrafish. And sure enough, a lot of copy number variations found in zebrafish that were supposedly supposed to be of the same strain and therefore very genetically identical, indeed are not identical with respect to copy number variation uh, of many genes in their genome. So finally, um, our work on the 1,000 Genomes Project, you may recall about five years ago, this was initiated uh, uh, with the NIH, with the Sanger Center. The idea here was for the first time to sequence 1,000 human genomes completely, not just the exomes, not just for certain targeted genes, but the complete human genome of a thousand individuals and to be able to develop the tools necessary to assemble those genomes accurately and, and then to look at uh, population uh, effects, uh, population genetic effects, et cetera. And so, uh, in fact, that project went on to, uh, pub to sequence not a thousand individuals but 2,500 individuals from across 26 populations and this is just diagrammatically shown here. Um, Gratefully, they were focused a lot of, about 80 percent, 85 percent of the effort was on single nucleotide polymorphisms, but we also had a group <coughs> focusing on structural variation. And we found, in fact, in phase one of the, of the 1000 Genomes Project, a lot of deletions. Couldn't find a lot of these other types of structural variations. Over time, into phase two and phase three, we were getting better at detecting more of these other types of structural variants. But bearing in mind that this, all, most of these genomes were, because of the price of sequencing, were on average sequenced at about 6, 8x coverage. And of course, we're far beyond that now, with probably about 30x as a minimum coverage of sequencing for a given human genome. And so uh, SVs, over the three phases of 1,000 genomes, you can see we can pick up deletions, duplications, inversions, insertions of the different size ranges uh, and the numbers of them. Uh, but in particular, what I wanted to point you to the fact was that uh, inversions, we were able to pick up a, a few, uh, but over the 2,500 individuals, collectively not a lot. Um, in, in September of 2015 was the end of the 1,000 Genomes Project, uh, and it was a back-to-back -back publication in Nature on this. Um, we were in a very good situation because the SV group had about an, another year and a half of funding left over, and we still had a lot of work to do. So we continued on uh, and had to rename ourselves because we weren't allowed to use the term 1,000 genomes anymore because that had ended. So we renamed ourselves the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium, led by myself, Jan Corbell at EMBL, and Evan Eichler at uh, Was University of Washington. And so wh what we decided to do was, okay, let's expand on this work. Uh, but we're going to need a lot of help in our next phase. Uh, and we uh, brought along these additional principal investigators, including uh, Mark Gerstein here at, at Yale. Um, and so we were able to develop this consort, uh, expand the consortium. And what we wanted to do was to uh, utilize multiple genomic platforms, which were now available, which weren't available even two or three years ago, to really try to comprehensively dis discover structural variation in selected individual genomes. We decided to focus in on three trios, uh, an African trio, a Han Chinese trio, and a Puerto Rican trio as an admixture uh, example. Uh, and each of these trios, uh, parents had, were looking at the daughters. Um, and basically we said, let's throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at these uh, three trios and see what we find. This is just a listing of all the DNA-based technologies uh, that we've applied to it. In particular, what I would focus, uh, emphasize here is probably for the first time in history, we have now been able to uh, use long read sequencing generated from PacBio to capture structural variation. It was something that we predicted would be very important uh, and, and uh, the, the technology was uh, developing, but now was at a stage where we could really apply this to structural variation uh, detection. We also had optical mapping type of technologies, as I mentioned, bionanogenomics, and, and new methods for detecting specifically inversions like strand C. Um, with the development, uh, with the application of these different technologies, right away 
we realized, and I think this, I hope this is an important message I'm getting to the audience, is that these companies are great at developing new technologies. They're horrible at developing algorithms to interpret the data that's coming out of these technologies. And so it's sort of left to us as a scientific community to, uh, to be able to develop these algorithms that would uh, accurately interpret the data that's being produced. So you, here's just a list of some of the different uh, algorithms that this Structural Variation Consortium has developed uh, as a result of this part of this project, incorporating all these new, the data from all these different technologies and just uh, sort of outlined here. Um, so uh, just to highlight a couple of these areas from the PAC bio, uh, this is sort of the, the methodology that we use for these long reads. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into all the details, just suffice it to say that uh, we use what's a, an algorithm called Blazor to align the reads. Uh, and there's a Solera assembly that goes on, uh, remapping the reads uh, with quiver consensus and then trying to assemble that uh, to identify structural variants. I can tell, uh, one important lesson that we found out from this, anyone that's using these PAC bio reads uh, for assembly and detecting structural variants or, or, or looking for other things, we had two groups, one from Mount Sinai, one from University of Washington, taking the same data set, making their SV calls, even using the same uh, alignment, but their calling algorithms were slightly different. Uh, they were able to get maybe 40% overlap on the structural variation calls. So you know, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to uh, find a pipeline, develop a pipeline that will give you accurate information consistently with a given data set. Um, so this, uh, so basically, uh, the, what we have, the data sets that we have so far, just from the PAC bio sequencing methods, we're finding in these three individuals, the daughters, upwards of about 30,000, 30,000 deletions and 30,000 duplications uh, occurring. So not, not looking at the other types, just deletions, duplications. When you send one of your whole genome sequencing data sets to a given uh, you know, company or et cetera, have a quick look at how many deletions and duplications they're reporting back to you. I think you're going to find that it's generally on the order of maybe upward of 500 to 1,000. Some of them may be going up to about 2,000. They're not getting anywhere close to about 20,000 deletions and duplications, which we're finding using about a 50 base pair cutoff and higher, there actually is all of these gains and losses in a given genome. So it's just something to be aware of, of how much data we're, we're missing when we're interpreting, uh, when we're getting this data sets back. Um, there are new methods. Uh, Ankit Mohaptra and my group is developing methods now that will take data from multiple technologies and combine them into an integrated data set. In his case, he's looking at Illumina, PacBio, and 10X Genomics, uh, doing population level discovery with Lumpy and then getting an integrated call set. Um, and this is just an example of that data set. Here's Illumina, here's PacBio uh, uh, data alone. And you can see that by looking at this, you can see this uh, structural variant in the father, inherited in the daughter, same thing from the PacBio uh, as well. And so trying to combine this data set to give increased, uh, 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 increased uh, 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 marks for, for this particular structural variant. Um, this is uh, the last thing that I want to show here is a method called StrandSeq. This was actually published in Genome Research last, last year uh, from the BC Cancer Agency. But basically, uh, without going into too much detail, involves DNA synthesis, incorporation of BRDU, and then doing DNA segregation, mitosis, isolation of single cells, library construction and removal of BRDU, and then beta alignment, and allowing us to actually visualize the, the reads along every chromosome in a genome-wide fashion. This would be what would be a normal result from StrandSeq. This would actually represent an inversion event uh, from StrandSeq. And this actually is a homozygous inversion. Uh, so these are just examples of the application of StrandSeq for the detection of inversions uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a given human genome, uh, both heterozygous and homozygous calls. And as I said, you can do this. Basically, the data is generated in genome-wide manner. And here's the data that we're getting. For each of these daughters, uh, we're finding, uh, so each of these uh, trios, uh, father, mother, daughter, 
you're seeing hundreds of inversions that are now being detected. So again, just to give you a reflection of where we've come, very, uh, up till even phase three of the human genome, uh, the Thousand Genomes Project, we were detecting either zero, possibly one inversion in a given human genome. Now we're detecting several hundreds of these inversions, which 90% of these have already been validated. So again, I ask you, when you send your whole genome sequencing data sets to a company or to a sequencing center and get the data back, have a quick look at how many inversions are they calling for you and understand what you're missing uh, from that data set. Now, inversions, you would, you would hope that most of these inversions are actually uh, simple in nature, but that's actually not true. Uh, over half of them uh, that we've looked at so far are actually complex, and in, in this case shown here, inverted duplications are, are more than half of the ones that we've studied so far. Simple inversions are, are, are about 42 out of 200 of those, uh, and then you can see inversions and deletions and, and multi-deletions with inversions, highly complex, which we can't even figure out yet what those involve. So, not that simple, but they're certainly uh, out there. So, in conclusion, uh, basically what's to come, uh, what we're trying to do is, as I said, understand more comprehensively uh, structural variation uh, for three trios, try to get an accurate haplotype, which I didn't get into, but uh, understanding which, which structural variants are actually on which chromosome and insist with other variants. Uh, studying the impact of these structural variants and on transcription, epigenome is, is stuff that's ongoing. Uh, understanding the rate and mechanisms of structural variation inheritance, ongoing. The advantages and limitations of various genomic platforms, very, very important. Um, there's no platform out there, I keep saying, that is one all and, and the best. Uh, you have to understand uh, not just what's good about it, but the limitations of it, and hopefully this study will help with that. Uh, provide the genetics community with a more comprehensive SV map and, and provide a gold standard of uh, platforms and methods for SV calling in whole genome data sets. So if, if you've fallen asleep and now waking up, uh, the really important message here is that this 99.9% .9 identity is, is really bogus. Uh, with what we are now uncovering with structural variation. The similarity between one another is probably more on the order of 92% uh, with SNPs and structural variation, which really makes a lot of sense because there is a lot of differences phenotypically from one to another, which uh, uh, some of that is accounted for these kind of genetic differences. So we really need to look at both SNPs and structural variants to understand more comprehensively human genetic variation and apply it to personalized medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you.